has sought to go beyond race, religion, ethnicity, gender, and culture. He is perhaps the most misunderstood, misrepresented, maltreated, and maligned person on the face of the earth. But not only is the stuff that makes him love all the more, he loves his enemies. He lives for the sake of others. And no cost is too great in order to bring back the family of God. He has committed his life to restoring us to God's true love, God's true life, and true lineage so that we look upon each other as brothers and sisters, one family under God. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Pastor Antonio. I'm so happy to have each and every one of you here with us on today. Uh, today is Monday. Uh, we're here all together once again to learn, uh, to, glean, uh, to glean some good, good information. Man, God is truly good to all of us on today. Is there anybody else that know that God is still good to all of us on today? That he is still able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or, or think, truly. So at this time, at this time, uh, we're going to go ahead and open up with a uh, prayer on today. And our very own, our very, very own uh, uh, doctor, uh, her, her herself, man, she is a phenomenal, a phenomenal woman of God. She is a 
of the CEO of the House of Judah uh, Empowerment Outreach Ministry. She is the founder and CEO, and that is no one other than our very own uh, Dr. Um, Melinda uh, Alexander. God bless you. Madeline Alexander. I'm butchering names tonight again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's all right. God bless you. You got it right. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Greetings, everyone. And thank you so much for the opportunity to come before you as a servant of God. Most gracious and heavenly father, we are gathered here tonight in the name of Jesus. Give us wisdom, give us revelation, knowledge, dear Lord, Father God, and understanding of the teaching. Open our hearts and anoint our ears to hear what thus saith the Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Parent, for the wisdom, knowledge, and love you have bestowed upon Reverend Sum Young Moon and Dr. Hacha Khan Moon, affectionately known as True Parents, to give them the gift, dear God, that they have given us, the gift that keeps on giving. Heavenly Parent, you are omniscient, you are omnipresent, you're in all places at all times, you know all things, empower us on tonight, dear Lord Father God, that you will be lifted up. In the last days, your word says that you will pour your spirit upon all flesh. So God, we pray for the hurting, we pray for the lost, we pray for the sick and the shut in, and those that are wandering in the desert, that when they cry unto you, dear Lord Father God, like David, you will hear their cry and you will or answer them. Father, we pray and ask that you bless this appointed time and excuse me, and you bless us continuously, dear Lord, Father God, that we will be a blessing to all humankind. In Jesus name, I place this petition before you and excuse me, in Jesus name and all blessed central families. Amen and adieu. Aju and amen. Aju and amen. Come on, let's give God praise for that amazing, yes. amazing yes. prayer. Yes. Amen. 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 Yes. Uh, it's so, man, she said the sick and the shut in. And she, uh, man, sometimes you just need to hear a word from God. And I, and I just thank God for all that he's doing. I, I'm not sure if y'all know, but my granny's still in the hospital and we're, we're praying that God sends a touch, a, a mighty, a mighty touch. You know, God only can touch like only he can do it. And so we're expecting God to just touch in a miracle. I will break through in Jesus name. Um, so nothing else being said so far. We're going to go ahead to our very own presenter on tonight. It, it will be our very own uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Sykes. He is a phenomenal, a phenomenal man of God. He is one of the greatest uh, men. I met him, uh, spent some time with him and his amazing wife in Korea. They are two uh, great, great uh, people. He serves on the executive board for ACLC. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our very own uh, Reverend Dr. Michael Sykes, who will be our presenter on tonight. God bless you all. In the media following him, we will be in the hands of our very own Reverend uh, Mark Hernandez, who will be giving us commentary and uh, going on from there. God bless you. Thank you so much. What a wonderful um, introduction uh, you gave me there, Dr. Antonio Bowen. That's very nice. Thank you. I want to use you all the time to introduce me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Hello, everybody. God bless you. I want to thank you all for um, coming tonight and sharing uh, in this chosen seminar. Uh, in particular, I want to thank um, those persons who um, invited me as a lecturer. Uh, whenever you are invited as a lecturer on chosen, that means you somebody. And so uh, I'm happy uh, uh, to be chosen <laughs> to uh, give this lecture um, this evening. So our challenge is the providence of restoration um, in Adam's family. Uh, that's what we're going to be talking about um, tonight. And so it's very important uh, that we would listen, uh, that we would um, understand uh, what the Lord is trying to say. <clears throat> now, there are two 
things that I think I want you really to um, understand because it's going to keep coming up in all these presentations, particularly the problems of restoration. And that is the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance. Those are two major points that you have to understand uh, in order to understand these, these uh, lectures. Uh, the foundation of faith is to be one with God, that's vertical. And the foundation of substance is to be one with your neighbor. That's horizontal. And once you have both of those operating and working, God blesses on that foundation. So God immediately began his providence uh, to restore fallen people by having Adam's family lay the foundation for the Messiah. For the problems of restoration to be accomplished in Adam's family, the members of his family had to make certain conditions of indemnity uh, to restore the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance. On these two foundations, the foundation for the Messiah was to have been established and the Messiah could have come um, to Adam's family. To restore through indemnity the foundation of faith for fallen people must set up a, an object for the condition. Due to his faithlessness, Adam lost the word of God, which God had been given him in order to fulfill the condition necessary to establish the foundation of faith. <clears throat> So he fell to the position where he could no longer receive the word of God directly because of his disobedience uh, to the word or the commandment that God gave him after God created him. So consequently, in restoring the foundation of faith, Adam had to faithfully offer in a manner acceptable to God some object for the condition substituting for God's word. For Adam's family, the, this object was a sacrificial offering. <clears throat> to restore the foundation of faith, there must also be a central figure. One would expect that that central figure in Adam's family be Adam himself. Yet, Nowhere in the biblical record do we find Adam offering a sacrifice. Instead, his sons, Cain and Abel, offered them, offered them. What was the reason for this? That's a wonderful question. According to the principle of creation, human beings were created to serve only one master. God cannot conduct his providence in accordance with the principle of someone who serves two masters. This is what the divine principle teaches us. But not only does the divine principle teach us that, but Jesus also says something like that. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will love one or hate the other. That's what Jesus says, according to the word of God. So if God were to accept Adam and his offering, Satan would use his tie of kinship with Adam as a condition through which to make a counterclaim upon him and his offering. In that case, Adam would be placed in the unprincipled situation of having to serve two masters, God and Satan. Therefore, God took the course of symbolically dividing Adam, embodying both good and evil into two entities, one representing good and the other representing evil. For this reason, God gave Adam two sons, representing good and evil, and set them in a position where each dealt with only one master. God 
or Satan. After setting up this arrangement, God had the two sons offer sacrifices separately. Amen. Cain and Abel were both sons of Adam. Which one of them was to represent goodness and which was to represent evil? Both Cain and Abel were the fruits of Eve's fall. Hence, their relative position were determined according to its course. Edom, Eve fell through two illicit acts of love. The first motivated by her excessive desire to enjoy what it was not yet time for her to enjoy. It constituted the spiritual fall with the archangel, unprincipled spouse, and the second motivated by her longing to return to God, led to the physical fall with Adam, her unprincipled spouse. Although the two were both fallen acts, the, act, the second act was more in line with the principle and more forgivable than the first. Since Cain was the first fruit of Eve's love, signifying Eve's first fallen act of love, he was chosen to represent evil. Since Abel was the second fruit of Eve's love, signifying Eve's second fallen act of love, he was, to, he was chosen to represent goodness. Satan had seized control of the creation, which God had created by the principle, and established an unprincipled world, having only the outward form of God's intended universe. In the original principal world, God intended to raise up the oldest son and have him inherit the birthright. Therefore, Satan felt a stronger attachment to the, old, to the eldest son than he did to the younger. Since Satan had already claimed the universe, he, he vowed with God for the eldest son, Cain, because God had a strong attachment to Cain, and God chose to deal with Abel, the younger son. Now, the Bible attests to the discrimination between first and second born sons. When the Israelites were born to flee Egypt, God struck the firstborn of the Egyptians, even the firstborn of their livestock. That's found in Exodus chapter 12, verse number 29. Because the Egyptians as Satan vassals stood in a position of Cain. It is written in the book of Romans chapter 9, verse 11 through 13, and we can read this in our own leisure that God loved the second son, Jacob, and hated the first son, Esau, even while they were still inside their mother's womb. They were placed in the positions of Cain or Abel, based solely upon the distinction of who was to be the firstborn son. According to the, this principle, God placed Cain and Abel in a position where each could deal with only one master and have them offer sacrifices. God could not accept Cain's sacrifice because Cain stood in a position to relate with Satan. He had a common bond, if I could use that, with Satan, which gave Satan rights over the sacrifice. He would have owned the sacrifice. 
So God received Abel's sacrifice because he stood in a proper relationship with God, one with God, and made the offering in a manner acceptable to him. In this way, Abel successfully laid the foundation of faith in Adam's family. Now, had Cain fulfilled the identity condition to remove the fallen nature, God would have gladly accepted his sacrifice. The foundation of substance would then have been laid in Adam's family. To remove the fallen nature, a person must make an indemnity condition by taking a course which reverses the process through which human beings initially acquire the fallen nature. The archangel fell because he did not love Adam. Rather, he, he envied Adam, who was receiving more love from God than he, the archangel, which is now called Lucifer. This caused the first primary characteristic of the fallen nature failing to take God's standpoint or seeing it from God's viewpoint. The archangel fell because he did not respect Adam as God's mediator and receive God's love through him. Rather, he attempted to seize Adam's position and this caused the second primary characteristics of the fallen nature leaving one's proper position. Very important. The archangel claimed dominion over Eve and Adam who were his rightful lords. This caused the third primary characteristic of the fallen nature, reversing dominion. God lost his dominion to Satan and to Lucifer. The archangel conveyed to Adam and Eve his evil will. This caused the fourth primary characteristic of the fallen nature, multiplying evil. Now listen, to remove these characteristics of the fallen nature, watch this, first Cain who stood in the archangel position should have taken God's standpoint by loving Abel which stood in Adam's position. So in other words, Cain should have loved Abel. Second, Cain should have received God's love through Abel, respecting him as God's mediator. That's what should have happened. And third, Cain should have obediently, obediently submitted to Abel, accepting Abel's dominion. And the fourth, Cain should have learned God's will from Abel multiplying goodness. For example, the religious way of life requires that we make our bodies submit to the commands of our higher mind. And we can see there on top. Just as Cain should have submitted to Abel and follow him, since we fell to the position of being deceitful above all things, found in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse number nine. I wish I had time to read it, but I don't have time to read it. But I would like to share that with you. The things of creation stand in the position of Abel. Hence, through offering them, we can go before God. Furthermore, the universal tendency to seek out good leaders and righteous friends stems from our innermost desire to come before God through an able figure who is closer to God by uniting with him. We can come closer to God ourselves. Now, Jesus came to this world as the able figure to whom all of humanity should have submitted and followed. For this reason, he said, no one comes to the Father 
but by me. And that's why when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. If Cain had yielded to Abel and thus fulfilled the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature in Adam's family, they would have established the foundation of substance and restore the family foundation for the Messiah. If that would have happened, then the Messiah could have came through that providence. However, look what happened. Cain killed Abel. And cocaine is killing our brothers. In murdering Abel, Cain repeated the sin of the archangel. That is, he reenacted the very process which had given rise to the primary characteristics of the fallen nature. Adam's family thus failed to lay the foundation of substance. And consequently, God's providence of restoration to Adam's family could not be fulfilled because there was not the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance. The foundation for the Messiah is established by first restoring through identity the foundation of faith and then establishing the foundation of substance. With regards to the requisite sacrifices, the foundation of faith is restored by making an acceptable symbolic offering and the foundation of substance is established by making an acceptable substantial offering. Let us examine the meaning and purpose of the symbolic offering and the substantial offering. Due to the fall, the three great blessings were lost. And we read that in Genesis 1 and 28. Uh, the fruitful multiply, and take dominion. But now these great blessings were lost. The, the way to restore them requires us to take the opposite course. First, we must establish the foundation of faith by making the symbolic offering, which fulfills an indemnity condition to restore all things and an indemnity condition to symbolically restore people. Next, we must establish the foundation of substance by making the substantial offering, which fulfills an indemnity condition to restore first the children and then the parents. On this basis, we can establish the foundation for the Messiah. We can consider the meaning and purpose of the symbolic offering in two ways. First, Adam gained dominion over the natural world, all things, through his dominion of fallen people. Thus, one purpose of the symbolic offering of all things is to fulfill an indemnity condition to restore all things. God's actual object partners in symbols. Second, since people fell to a position below all things, fallen people, again, Jeremiah 17 and 9, in order for them to come before God, they must go through all things according to the principle of creation, that one approach God through that which is closer to him. The second purpose of the symbolic offering is thus to fulfill an indemnity condition to symbolically Restore people. Following the order of creation in which God created all things, first and human beings afterwards, the substantial offering as an internal offering to restore human beings can only be made on the basis of an acceptable symbolic offering. The substantial offering fulfills an indemnity condition to completely restore people by making the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature. 
The substantial offering is carried out when a person in Cain's position honors the person in Abel's position and sets him above himself as an offering. Through this, they fulfill the identity condition to be restored as good children, which is also reckoned as the indemnity condition to restore their parents. To establish the foundation for the Messiah in Adam's family, Adam should have been the one to establish the foundation of faith by making the symbolic offering. However, Adam could not make the offering because of the unprincipled situation where his two masters, God and Satan, who had contended over it. In addition, there is another reason from the aspect of feeling, of feeling and heart. Fallen Adam was the very sinner who caused God the heartache and grief, which was to last many thousands of years. He was not worthy to be the beloved of God's heart, with whom God could work directly to further the providence of restoration. Accordingly, God chose Adam's second son, Abel, in his stead, and had Abel make the symbolic offering. Then God had Cain and Abel make the substantial offering. Before the substantial offering could be made, the central figure of the offering, the one who is to be offered, must be chosen. In other words, God and had Abel make the symbolic offering for two reasons. First, to have him establish the foundation of faith in Adam's place. And second, to qualify him to be the central figure of the substantial offering. Cain was the one to fulfill the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature. Yet his accomplishments would have resulted in the entire family of Adam fulfilling the condition. How, how was this possible? Question mark. If Cain had yielded to Abel and fulfilled the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature, both children would have been regarded as having fulfilled the indemnity condition together. Cain and Abel were offsprings of Adam, the embodiment of both good and evil. Now, had they unshackled themselves from Satan chains by fulfilling the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature, their father Adam also could have separated from Satan and stood upon the foundation of substance and their family would have established the foundation for the Messiah. Why? Because according to the principle, the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance was could have been established, but it was not established in Adam's family. When Adam made his sacrifice in a manner acceptable to God, he fulfilled the indemnity condition to restore the foundation of faith and firmly secured his position as the central figure of the substantial offering. However, when Cain murdered Abel, they failed to make the substantial offering. Hence, neither the foundation of substance nor the foundation for the Messiah could not, could be established. God, providence of restoration as a family came to naught. It came to nothing. 
because God could not work on that foundation. First, from the time of creation, God predestined that his will be accomplished based on the combined fulfillment of God's portion of responsibility and the human portion of responsibility. God not, God could not instruct Cain and Abel on how to properly make their sacrifices because it was their portion of responsibility that Cain makes his sacrifice with Abel's help. Second, even as after Cain killed Abel, God began a new chapter in human history of his providence by raising Seth in Abel's place. This shows us that God has absolutely predestined that his will shall one day be fulfilled, even though his predestination concerning individual human beings is conditional. Third, through the offering of Cain and Abel, God teaches us that fallen people must constantly seek for an able type person by honoring, obeying, and following him. We can establish God's will even without understanding every aspect of God's will. The province which God worked to accomplished through Adam's family have been repeated over and over again due to the faithlessness of human beings. And consequently, this course remains as the dignity course which we ourselves must walk. The process of restoration in Adam's family thus provides us with many valuable lessons for our own path of faith. Amen. And thank you so much for listening. And next week, we will talk about the providence of restoration in Noah's family. At this time, we go back to Dr. Antonio Bowen. Amen. Actually, <laughs> we come to me. Okay, uh, Mark. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It, you, 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 this has been a great presentation, uh, Dr. Sykes. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, because you put a lot of emphasis on the very important parts. Let's let's all appreciate uh, Dr. Michael Sykes for that wonderful presentation tonight. Wow. And I thought I saw uh, Bishop Edwards on this call. And uh, one second, let me if he's still there. Well, he was there earlier. If he is on the call, maybe he'll, he'll uh, come back. Um, well, Dr. Sykes, there was so much that you covered. And uh, what I want to remind everybody about was that last week when we had uh, uh, Christian and Seca, Minister Christian and Seca with us, he was speaking about the, uh, the introduction to restoration, you know, the whole setup of restoration. And uh, I think it's really important to go back to one major point, and that was that is, even if there had not been a fall, even if there had not been a fall, Adam and Eve had a course of growth that they needed to accomplish. They did. They needed to accomplish a foundation of faith in God's word, right? Uh, so that they could grow to full maturity. They had to keep God's word, God's command. You you made a point, Dr. Sykes of the fact that Adam lost God's word. He lost God's word. That major word that he had given them, not only was the three blessings, but not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which um, in, our, in our lessons here in the 12 hour exposition of the divine principle, we've come to understand what that sin was. And of course you repeated it again today in looking at the, uh, the fall, and uh, the two falls, the spiritual fall and the physical fall uh, that Eve uh, committed and Adam committed. Um, 
So Adam would have had to uh, keep that word, obey that word through a particular time period. And that would be the time period for his, his physical maturation and his internal maturation. Um, most men, most men are uh, mature uh, physically and spiritually, sometimes in their early 20s, sometimes in their late teens. But he was to have kept that word until God could bless him. He was to keep that word until God could bless her in that holy marriage. So the foundation of faith would be first made in that relationship with keeping God's word, showing faithfulness to God's word, and then growing to become the incarnation of God's word. As a man, the incarnation of God's word as a woman, uh, we're, we're talking about Eve. Um, the, there's so much here to unpack and to look at. Uh, I thought it would be maybe worthwhile to go to the Bible. Uh, and I'm looking in Genesis, the fourth chapter. And this is basically going to be the, the narrative about the, uh, the two offerings of the two sons. And it mentions the, the offerings by the brother's uh, age. In Genesis 4, chapter, uh, ver chapter 4, verse 3, and this is a New International Version. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering of fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today, you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. <clears throat> I think it's really important to read that story. You mentioned that God could not intervene. But my, oh my, because God feels so responsible for having made us, for having made Adam and Eve, and thereby for having, you know, made it possible for the birth of, of Cain and Abel though God cannot intervene. You know, it talks about Abel making his offering in an acceptable manner to God. Did we read anything about a dialogue between God and, and Abel? 
No, I didn't read anything there in the Bible where there's a dialogue, there's a, or at least a, a conversation or God speaking to Abel. But what we see right there from Genesis 4 is God's love. You mentioned, Dr. Sykes, that had they, had they really gotten this foundation of substance, they would both be victorious. They would both have overcome to the point that their family then could receive the Messiah. Their father would, his actually, his position would be elevated from the one that was dominated by Satan or in a midway position, he could come out of that position because his sons had actually gone beyond their father. The sons had restored love. It's all about love. Those, those four points of what it takes to uh, establish the foundation of substance, it's food for all of us. Because all of us are, uh, are you know, fruits of the fall. We're all born from a lineage that carries that curse. And again, you know, the other day I was just praying on Adam's family and I just kept thinking, imagine, you know, <laughs> the first family and the eldest son in that family kills the second born son. They lived in the, you know, they lived. We can maybe imagine some scenarios in our day and time of a person living in an environment that was really um, maybe would be have a lot of fertilizer for that kind of activity, that kind of, but right in the first family, we have murder. Murder, not of a stranger. We have violence, not toward an outside stranger. And it's because Cain, for this setup of the, the foundation of substance to be realized, we can see that God does not despise Cain at all. We can see that God does not have a grudge against Cain at all. That God wants Cain to overcome. But Cain is placed in a position where he's going to feel all the same emotions the archangel felt toward Adam and Eve that we studied in the fall, right? We studied that, you know, he felt jealous. He felt a, a lack of love. And that lack of love drove Lucifer to try to bring uh, under dominion Eve and thereby uh, bring Adam under his dominion. So everything that Cain is being, in a way, asked to do so that Cain can really liberate mankind, liberate himself and his brother and his father and his family from Satan's curse is to do everything that the archangel could not keep from doing. Everything that Lucifer could not keep from doing is what Cain should have done. And we can see that that's what, you know, God is warning him that sin is crouching at the door. There's some actually, uh, Older versions of the Bible, other versions of the Bible that say that Satan is crouching at the door or couching at the door. He's in position. He's ready to claim you. He's ready to claim you. But it's up to you. You can do this. You can get victory over him. You can get victory over him. And even, even we see in the Bible that even after this, even after the birth of Seth, and Seth is able to, and I mean, there was like a condition for Seth to be born because of Abel's faithfulness, even though Abel is killed. Even from the lineage of Seth, we're going to see that, that dynamic over and over and over again. We're going to see the dynamic of two brothers, one firstborn, one secondborn, And what really God is looking for is for the two of them to work it out, the two of them to get victory in love. 
for the elder to submit to the younger and not lose anything at all. The lie is that I'm going to lose something if I'm humble. I'm going to lose something if I submit to the one that's closer to God. We see the phenomena happen over and over again. We ourselves are often tested. We see ourselves, you know, sometimes maybe someone says, gives you a slight. Someone makes you, uh, says a word to you or gives a look to you that seems to put you down. You have more years in the ministry than them. You have more, you know, you're more established. And you get so tempted to leave your position and say something snide back to that person or worse. This is our homework, our homework to pray that we can see from God's point of view, to keep God's standpoint, to pray that we maintain our position. Think about it. Everyone on this call, everyone on this call is both in a Cain position to someone else or an Abel position to someone else, right? Within our, within our denominations and faith, we have spiritual elders, people that we look up to spiritually because of their leadership, their years of service, their devotion, their, their amazing personalities and character of integrity. And then we have people that might look up to us, who see in us those same qualities and, and look to us as their pastor, as their spiritual guide and spiritual leader. And ultimately, as you said, Reverend Sykes, it's, you know, who's, our, who's, who's a greater central figure than Jesus? Or, you know, who's a, central, a greater central figure than the Messiah or, or Christ? You know, the one who actually overcame. But actually, what did the world have a hard time doing? We're, you know, the world had a hard time accepting that able, uniting with that able, seeing that able from God's point of view seeing the value of another person. These are really great, you know, it's a great therapy. It's a great therapy that when we're in a difficult situation, maybe in, in our jobs or in our work or in our school or in our life, where we take time before something comes out of our mouth that we can't take back. Or even worse actions than just our mouth before I do something that I will regret. Taking some breaths, calming myself down and, and thinking, I really want to see that person from God's point of view. I want to take God's standpoint. I want to take God's viewpoint. Please God, show me how you see so-and-so so that I may love him or her as you love him or her. Please, God, give me the strength to maintain and keep my position, that I step not out of my position. Because we can step both ways, right? If we're someone's able, we can, we, can, we can just mess that up. And if we're somebody's, we are, are the cane to someone. We're, we're the follower, and then we, we reverse dominion, and we try to take dominion over there. We can mess things up a lot, too. So it's really important for us to, to take this lesson, this first lesson. We're going to see it, as I said, uh, in one of your last slides, uh, uh, Pastor Sykes. It says this condition has been repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. We could say ad, ad nauseum to the point of it makes us nauseous. It makes us just want to weep, put our head, our head in our hands and weep because there's a predictability because of fallen nature. Fallen nature becomes a predictable thing. That's why when Jesus was on the cross and Jesus was tortured day after day after day, it torture from one place to the next place to the next place, and ultimately had to carry his cross with Simon's help. 
you know, the devil was waiting for him to curse mankind. But Jesus did not leave his position. Thank God. Jesus did not leave his position. Jesus asked the Father to forgive us. He asked the Father to forgive us. We're, we're really looking forward to the next, the next uh, step in this, Dr. Sykes, the looking at Noah's family. Yeah. Every one of these, uh, these, these main families of Noah, uh, I mean, of Adam's family, Noah's family, and then ultimately Abraham's family are meant to be lessons for us, lessons for me, lessons for each uh, human being in our life of faith. Yeah. So um, I know I've got uh, Madeline, Dr. Madeline Clark on the, uh, on the call with us. She opened us in prayer and you've made these presentations yourselves. I'd like to invite you, uh, Dr. Clark, to, uh, or Dr. Clark Alexander, sorry, uh, to offer any kind of comments on tonight's uh, content. Well, Greg, you know, you, you read these, you read the divine principle and you read the Bible and we, we know we have this information, but every time you hear it, it takes us to a higher standard of living and expectation of what God expects from us. And it helps us to put things in a different perspective. So I appreciate the fact, you know, when we talk about Cain and Abel, when we talk about good and evil, our, our heart's desire is to be good and to do the right things. But in the same token, the Bible tells us that the heart know of no good thing. You know, it's like Paul spoke, when I want to do good, bad is forever present. So it lets me know that we have to be conscious on a daily basis about the decisions that we make and to be able to look at it beyond the initial thought. My father used to say, honeypot, it was a good idea at the time, but when it doesn't play out and I don't get the expected outcome, then I can look at it a little different and say, well, dad, maybe it wasn't. So I think this gives us the opportunity to look at the word, dissect the word, and really dive into it to get the meat of God's heart and how we live our lives. And thank you for allowing me to share. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I really, really appreciate that because uh, it's what exactly what you said. It's, these are life's lessons, but what is presented, of course, through the divine principle, are these very central figures, central figures of God's providence. And many times we think, well, that's just in the Bible. That's just them. It really has no application towards myself. But we can see that this dynamic, this dynamic of overcoming the, the foundation of substance, which is other, also described as the foundation to remove the fallen natures that we inherited, from Lucifer, that we inherited from Adam and Eve, that we've inherited from this lineage, that, that there is an opportunity for us. And I truly really believe that for each of us, just like the first person came, that God is rooting for us. God is whispering to us or shouting to us sometimes, telling us, you know, wait, cool, cool down, cool down. Yeah cool down, put on the, let's put on the brakes on this, right? You can make a much better decision, Mark. You can make a much better decision, Michael. You can make a much better decision, you know, Stephen. You can make a much better decision, you know, whoever we are. God is wanting us to hold it, take a deep breath, because that's not the real you, Mark. I know you've got more inside of you than that. And I want to see your victory. I want to see your victory. God was rooting for Cain's victory, which would have been Cain and Abel's victory, which would have been the victory of Adam's family. So our victory is not our own. It's not just mine. It's, it's a shared victory, you know, because actually Abel could have, I mean, Cain could have gone to Abel and Abel would have been blown away that his older brother approached him with such a humble heart. Brother, can you tell me how your offering was accepted? Please help me to find out how God can accept my offering. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your uh, attentive listening today. I don't know. I thought 
I saw in the participants an iPhone. I don't know if that was Dr. Rouse. He said that he might be able to stop in tonight. Is that you, Dr. Rouse? By any chance? Okay. Well, we're about that. We're about the, at the end of our time tonight. And as I've said before, one of the first persons always on this call is uh, Minister Carmen Alexis. And I'd like to invite you to close us in prayer tonight. Thank you so much. Let us pray. Our wise and eternal heavenly father and our wonderful parents. Lord God, thank you, Lord God, for the wonderful meetings that we have, Lord God, every Monday. And Lord God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Bless all, bless all the participants who have joined us on Zoom every Monday. Bless, bless all, bless all the preachers, bless all the preachers and the first ladies and all the members, Lord God, of ACLC. And Lord God, in Jesus' mighty name, we offer this prayer to you, Lord God. Stand right by our side, Lord God, as we leave this place. And Lord God, in Jesus' name, be with us, Lord God, on tonight, Lord God. Be with us, Lord God, in the United States and Canada and around the world. And Lord God, as we close this prayer, as we close this meeting, Lord God, we were always going to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It's in the mighty and the matchless name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Our hearts and our soul says a mighty, mighty, mighty amen and achu. Amen. amen and achu. Wow, what a beautiful prayer. Thank you for that prayer. Beautiful. God bless you. God bless you, Antonio. Thank you for being our MC. And for guiding us through this. God bless you, everyone on the call tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Young Soon. If you were there on the call with us a little bit, thank you too for you. God bless you all. Oh, God bless. Oh. Take the building. Say the wise. Yeah. YCOC, CARP. Peace starts with you and me. Let's get it. I wish I could put everybody on the plane and take a trip around the world so they can see how we are all the same and we all go through pain but love still remains i think they have a solution to wipe away all the confusion so the world need a lot of love so the world need a lot of love inside of all of us if we just show the world that we are one and they are part of us we could fill their hearts with love then we could spark that change that turns the darkness to the light in us because love is joy peace patience kindness let's spread that like the virus tear down these walls that divide us because we are made in the same likeness light it up all over the world love shines inside these boys and girls to smile laugh dance sing because love can conquer
can change the world with all of us. Love. The world needs a lot of love, a lot of love. Lift your flags up and light it up, light it up with love. All right. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Antonio. That was a great way to that close us out. That was an exciting ending. God bless yeah, you all. Thank you all, everyone, for your attention. Good night. Thank you. God bless. Good night. God bless. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Dr. Alexander, thank you. God bless. Dr. Thank Sykes. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Michael Jenkins. Hey, Dr. Michael Jenkins, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> There he is. How are you? He's muted. He's muted, yes. Pastor Glenda, God bless you. God bless you. Thank How you. Are you. How are you? Thank How you. Are you? How are you, family? Hi, Reverend Marilyn. Hi, God bless you, Linda, Pastor Linda. And thank um, you, God Carmen, bless you. Carmen, everybody. <laughs> Have Thank a wonderful that. evening. God bless you. Be blessed, blessed, everyone. Be blessed, family. God loves you. Bless so bless wow. Oh, God bless you. God bless. Be blessed, family.